This episode of Good Investing Talks is supported by Interactive Brokers. If you're ever looking for a broker, Interactive Brokers is the place to go. I personally use their service because I think they have a great selection of stocks and markets you can access. They have super fair prices and a great tracking system to track your performance. If you want to try out the offer of Interactive Brokers and support my channel, please click on the link below. There you will be directed to Interactive Brokers and can get an idea what they offer for you. I really like their tool and it's a high recommendation by me. And now enjoy the video. Hello, Philip. You're currently in Munich or where are you? Yeah, yeah, around Munich. We had to move out a little bit because we got small kids and it's, you have a little bit more space, a little bit more nature out there, but it's not far and we're close to lakes. It's high living quality, yeah. You have just defined yourself as a father, but uh, what is your role in the financial industry, in the finance world? Are you a finance YouTuber? Are you a fund manager? What is your role? I would say I'm I'm a fund manager and now I'm really a fund manager since five weeks and all the other things I did before, um, I think were aimed to reach that target. You know? Your story is quite interesting because you've built a fund business that uh, is already very successful with three ingredients. One is transparency, one is the power of social media, and the third is a good performance. Um, your fund is currently at a size of around 10 million or so? Yeah, today it's 24 million. Okay, yeah. <laughs> then I really have to update my numbers and uh, congrats to the to great growth of the assets and the management. Uh, and let's take this as a chance to go back in time and understand how you've built your fund business. With YouTube, it's quite interesting that uh, we can take a look at your channel um, back in 2016, I think, or somewhere in the back in the past to the first video you've published. I would translate this video title with the FAIR PE, a stock picking strategy based on fundamental data and trends. What is the FAIR PE? And do you still use this fair PE today in your investing approach? Yes. And I think um, it's impressive because the strategy hasn't changed um, since 2016 when I developed this model. It's pretty basic at the end, but I think it combines a lot of concepts. And um, because when I started, you start, I don't know, as a value investor normally. Yeah? And then you try to find low PE stocks. Yeah, I don't know, with 18, 19 and then you realize, okay, a lot of companies, there's a reason why the PE is so low. Yeah? And um, then I, I try to combine um, um, the thing with quality and with a fair price. I think it's it, in the end, it's a it's a GAAP investment model, grows at reasonable prices. And that's, that's my strategy. Because on the other hand, what we're also seeing today a lot is people that just buy a story. I mean, there are a lot of good companies. But if I buy a company for 30, 40 times revenue, I think a lot of things is baked in. And I try to find those good companies who trade for reasonable uh, multiples. And um, I think this model, at the end, there are 16 criteria and I judge it from 1 to 10, a score. And um, then there's an average score between 1 and 10. And for example, a 10 would be the perfect company. It doesn't, doesn't exist. And the nine would be world class company. I think I did 500 to 1000 um, analyzed like that. And I think there are just five, six, seven, or maybe 10 uh, companies with a nine plus score. Um, and for them, it's a really high PE. I think it's justified. And then if you're like an, an above average company, it would be eight. And um, then it's a 20 times PE. But I mean, the model was developed when we, there was just still interest rates in the market. And now in, in times of negative interest rates, maybe um, you also can um, increase a little bit uh, the fair PE ratios. That uh, is not included in the model. Um, for sure, it's basic and you can say it's subject, subjective. But yeah, and first, yeah, I'm not a native um, and uh, I'm reading every day, maybe one, two hours in English, but I'm not talking so much in English um, anymore because um, we went a different direction. My YouTube channel is completely in German. And um, because I always had the target group um, German investors um, for, for the fund, where see the um, um, market opportunity. And that's, <laughs> I um, apologize for my English, but I think the people will, under, will understand. And uh, um, the model I'm still 
using today. That was the question. But I um, have another model what's based on a fair PE. If you translate it like that, it's called QFMA. It stands for Quality, Fundamental, Momentum, and Alpha. And it has four um, steps. The first step would be 0.5% or even less weighting in the portfolio. This has just to be a quality company. The valuation doesn't have to be um, very attractive, but the next step would be then 1%, then it should have an attractive valuation for the FAIR PE or another model, SOTP, or the sum of the parts or um, the FAIR revenue. And, ne- and the third step would be um, momentum position, that the long-term momentum is um, positive. And I th- the, the most important, I call the core position, then I try to find an investment case with an alpha idea where I think I see something in the market or in this company or what the market hasn't found yet. And if I'm right, um, I will generate alpha. And if I'm not right, it's often not so um, problematic because it's not baked in the price. Yeah, that's um, um, my investment strategy, if, if you want to sum it up. Don't worry about your English. Um, I already had interviews with natural German speaking uh, conversation partners and they <laughs> survived it as well. And we did a good interview. So don't worry about it. In your models of analyzing stock, you have a certain trend factor embedded. So what role does trend play for you? Yeah, I mean, if you're a value investor, you always make a little bit fun about trend investing. But if you're for long times in the market, especially um, in, in the short term, it plays a role. And um, I use it for the weightings. I think I, I almost never buy a company just because the trend is nice. But if I have, for example, four interesting companies, they're very similar, then I think it makes sense to invest more in the company with an um, attractive trend at the moment because you have other people looking for it. You, um, and also you have even more and more algorithms who, who invest in trend following. And often it's also a risk protection because if the trend is positive um, and you think the company um, is attractive, then probably your risk is a bit lower because if the trend is very negative and you think it's the best chance ever, maybe you're overlooking something or nobody cares about what you're thinking. And maybe this change, but it can take a long time or even you make a mistake. And if you look at the really, really huge mistakes, um, also big uh, name investors did, then they fall in love with one company. They think, yeah, I'm right. I have the big ego and they're buying, buying, buying. The trend gets negative. And I don't want to do that. Um, For sure, I stay invested, but not more than 1%. And that's something, um, even if I make a mistake or something happens, what you cannot calculate, um, the fund performance of this year is not dependent from from this um, 1% uh, position. You've mentioned two concepts. I want to do a follow-up question on. One is algorithm. The other is mistakes. So let's start with the algorithm. You have a huge portion of quantitative data in your framework to analyze stocks. And do you worry that this will be copied and you will lose the alpha generated by this quantitative setup? It's very hard to copy it. I think it's very hard to copy it because um, the model works for me and I looked at a thousand companies and um, I didn't analyze with my model. I think if you just start, it's very difficult and you have to have the knowledge of so many um, different companies that you say, okay, that's an eight management or six management. And um, also like an alpha idea, it's not something what's in in the model, some idea you, you have. And for sure, if somebody sees that's my alpha idea, maybe people can copy it. But if I'm invested, the, um, it also helps the stock price then. So I think I, I w- wouldn't want to com- complain. And also what you see on my YouTube channel, I always want to share what I'm doing, what a lot of things are, are going good, but some stuff that also doesn't work, but you learn from it. And um, often you get um, very good feedback from people. And um, I also am using for that. So it's not like a quantitative model where you have like some formula and then you apply this formula and then um, somebody can copy it because the main input factors are subjective um, um, grades from from me, from my knowledge, from from my judgment, and I think it's that's hard to copy. But I think people should 
think more about quality evaluation, momentum, and alpha, and try to combine those things. And it's maybe also very from the personality. I try to combine the things uh, or the, the best things what works for me from different schools of investing. And I don't want to be seen just. Um, I'm just a value investor, just a growth investor, just a momentum investor. I try to um, um, pick everything up, uh, what works for me. And if you combine it, um, I think it can uh, work pretty well. Maybe let's go to the next point. I want to do a follow-up question on it's, it's mistakes. What mistakes have you done over time with this model and how has it changed based on the mistakes you did? I think there are two kind of mistakes. Um, I mean, Mistakes where I didn't apply the model, yeah, because at the end, is the trend positive or negative? It's also a judgment call sometimes, yeah, and then, um, or sometimes, I'm still the final decision still does a human, and some, sometimes you're not so consequent, and that's a mistake. Uh, I don't, li I don't like, yeah, and then, and then there are mistakes. I wouldn't say call it mistakes, but investments which went wrong. But if the model was right and I would do it again. That's the normal cost of doing business. Um, and I developed those models after huge mistakes I did. For example, the fair PE model. Um, uh, there was a company, a German e-commerce company. It's called Get Goods. Doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, that was a mistake. Um, they were growing fast. The valuation was much um, more attractive than competitors and they had um, huge margins in electronic e-commerce. And I always wondered why can they be, be so much better than the others? And the management team, they had really not good CVs. And, um, but it looked so attractive. So I bought it and it went bankrupt and it was a fraud at the end. Or I don't know what it was, but it, it's, <laughs> it went uh, to zero. And then I realized that I have to more include the soft factors in my model. And also um, I studied at the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland. Where, there we have the St. Gallen management model with stakeholder, et, et, et cetera. And I mean, I think they're pushing that for 20 years. Now it's got more mainstream, but maybe that also influenced me. Um, so I think mistakes in the model is more that I don't apply the model uh, correct. And, um, but I really believe in the model. Uh, and um, if investment doesn't work, uh, then you reduce the risk and etc. It's I didn't. The huge mistakes were not like on a single stock basis the last three four years, but more a macro was complicated. I mean, we had two China crises first with Trump, now with the regulation, and that's for me more difficult because I'm at the end a bottom up analyst. So I look at the company and I try to judge the uh, prospects of the company. And I think I don't have an edge what Mr. Xi or Mr. Trump will do. For sure, sometimes you have some um, some feeling, and, and you also you're, you're managing the risk a little bit with the momentum. But for sure, um, if China internet halves, um, even if you reduce the risk, uh, you still feel it in, in the performance. Yeah. Does the model work differently with different company sizes? Like, uh, how does it work with small caps, and how does it work with large caps? Um. Well, the big difference is liquidity. Yeah? Um, I mean, I managed the, the model for my private portfolio with a return, I think, 1,100% since 2012. But at the end, I didn't have market impact with this portfolio. So with a fund, maybe if you change from the momentum from 4% to 1% or from 1% to 4%, um, you would think twice whether you change this weightings in a small cap. Um, stock and in a in a large cap, you just can trade it in one day. I think that's the the huge difference. Otherwise, it's it's not. And maybe it's more easier to find alpha ideas in the small cap. But there also, I would say, there are alpha ideas sometimes in in large caps, um, especially if the media is very negative to to one topic, and then often you, there are chances. Yeah. So then, do you think about limiting the size of your investment vehicles to still generate alpha and smaller and mid caps, um, or no, no, um, no? My idea for the fund, it's called Haas Invest for Innovation, is that you can um, invest in all the growth companies. I, I call the stocks offensive, yeah. And um, for sure, at the beginning, their um, small caps have a, a bigger weighting, but and maybe the portfolio would look a little different if the fund is very huge. 
but it's not a small cap factor. And I would say my investment strategy is not based um, that it's a small cap. Yeah, it's just your um, you have you can choose from more stocks. Yeah, if you if you if you're small, and I would say maybe stocks with hundred million market cap. They are 10 to 20% of the portfolio. So it's something, but it's not the core of the strategy. And even if you would have 500 million, I think you still can invest in a 100 million company. You just don't can invest in a, uh, with a 4% rating. Then maybe you have it just with a 0.5% or something. Maybe let's go to your YouTube channel and take a look from the video from 2016, how the amount of videos has developed till today and maybe let's try to scroll through it and let's see how many videos these are and uh, youtube is quite helpful and it gives us a count of the videos there are 1491 videos you've put out since 2016 and i calculated it by the days it's one video every 1.5 days <laughs> this is really impressive um maybe <laughs> let's start with the question here about How did you get the ideas for the videos? Well, I would say like maybe 500 videos, they're like two minutes where I explain some basic stuff. Yeah, there. I mean, you have at the end in YouTube, you have two strategies. You can go for search or you can go for viral. And I wanted to first go search and the shelf life of this content is also very long. Uh, what's, I don't know, EBITDA or something. People are still looking three, four years later. And I wanted to start with this as a base. Um, very I would, not very professional but the videos are still out there and the other videos i think with my model i can analyze a stock produce a video about it in less than one day and um i, I mean i was doing that more or less full time for two years trying to do one video a day and um it's also like i would say like a part of my research process huh? because um i had of the portfolios in my private portfolio. I did the research and then as an add-on, I got to produce a video. And um, then that also people also, um, I can help other people or um, I can discuss the, the stock and um, and you also can create a part-time business apart no? because if you just have the stock market, it's um, very volatile. Uh, some years um, you lose money. So um, that was also the idea to have like an, um, a side business. And also to prepare for sure um, the start of an investment fund. And I think the model I did, um, especially with the low fees, I think it's the cheapest um, fund for private investors in Germany in, uh, for stocks. Um, and that's just possible because in, in there's no middleman and there's no provision because people who know me can buy directly the fund. And uh, I think that's in, uh, interesting. And uh, I try to lower the fees for everybody with that. And maybe like with Trade Republic, um, at some time, um, others have to um, uh, comply. I don't know. Yeah. At least um, the, you also see it with the broker fees that they came down. And I think, I mean, also active investing got a little bit like a, a bad reputation. Um, but that the problem is the most funds are too expensive and too close to the index. But per se, if you're index independent and if you're cheap, I think you will always have a relevance. And I think maybe we will see a revival of that. So the YouTube channel was a tool to create some extra income, but I think it was more a tool to create a trusted brand. And maybe more the trust is, uh, is important as the brand. Is this true? Yeah. I mean, I realized this business at the end is pretty simple. I would say you need 50% performance and 40% brand trust reach and maybe 10% of it entrepreneurship. And I, I think I'd, I'd try to focus on those three things, especially the, the two most important. You have to be good, but also people have to know that you're good. And um, often from the personality, a lot of people there may be very good, but I also have a friend who's a very good investor But if you talk with him, you don't know what he's doing. Yeah. And if I don't know it, he probably has uh, huge problems that other um, normal investors uh, will, will understand that. And I think it's also helpful that you are able to explain it in, um, normal language, what you're doing. And like you see my, my model, that's not rocket science. But if you're an experienced investor, you realize, okay, I'm using, Uh, at, at the end, academic proven outperformance factors and combine it with um, a little bit alpha and a little bit uh, knowledge. And that's, um, 
worked in the past, why shouldn't it work in the future? So um, yeah, YouTube was definitely, the idea was a side business, um, but um, also for sure to, to prepare the start of a fund. And also what's very important for me is the topic financial education. Um, I was involved in the um, start of a company um, called Finanztip.de. Yeah, it's, I think it's now the biggest um, financial education website in Germany where people get explained how um, to invest or how to do taxes, especially because so many mistakes are, are made, in, especially in Germany, because the financial literacy is, I, I would say, it's pretty low. I think it's improved a lot in the last two, three years. Maybe also thanks to YouTube's channels like yours, but also like um, bigger ones to do more mainstream content. But I think it, it helped a lot. And um, um, yeah, this was also a motivation for me. And also I wrote a book. Yeah, we have to link it below so people can find it. Yeah, <laughs> it's just in German, but um, and it's more also about the soft topics in life um, and why investing is so important. It's not, not just about investing and it's based on... Uh, um, yeah, it's a more summer book. Yeah, it's a, a road trip, and and the contents a bit like uh, um, included in a, in, a, in a summer story. Yeah. I haven't read it, but I've heard good things about it, so uh, I will put it in my reading list for the summer. Uh, it takes a some time to we get back to, back to summer, but uh, something to be happy about. <laughs> Maybe it's also a good reason to say thank you for all the work you did for the investing community because you helped many people understand stock picking and uh, were one of the channels that had a certain quality with it. So it's not that often that someone, you also worked as a fund manager uh, at one big fund in Germany that has this quality coming to the public and educating people here, especially in Germany where it's financial education isn't that big of a topic. Um, Maybe tell us a bit more about the phase where you've been a fund manager, what you have taken away from this and why it did work. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I started with an investment block in 2014. Yeah? And um, the investment, I think, was very helpful for me because I could develop my investment style. I did a lot of um, analysis. You still can read it under investorsearch.net. But as a business, I have to say it failed because I had um, two targets. Um, I wanted to earn a little bit of money. Yeah, this, this didn't really work. And I wanted that people know me and then buy my wiki for looks, for example. And that also didn't happen because the people who are reading my blog, they were investing in stocks on their own and they didn't buy wiki for looks. And wiki for looks at that time was still pretty exotic, still is to, to some degree. And this um, uh, didn't work out. But I always had... I mean, from the opportunity, because I knew if I have a blog, but um, you can show what you did, then I think it wouldn't be hard to get an interesting job in the investment company. And uh, I didn't know so many. There was just uh, one big one in Munich and I applied and um, they also liked what they saw. And um, I started there as an analyst. I did the internet sector, like the big um, <laughs> American and Chinese internet companies. And then after one year, I also did the fund and um also, I always had the target to also understand the industry more from the inside. And um, um, I think I, I definitely would do it again. I learned a lot there, but I also uh, it more confirmed me in my investment thesis that um, I can do things a little bit differently. And um, I think there's a lot of um, opportunities to to, um, to bring the investment fund industry a little bit um, in the modern world. And um to do the things a little cheaper, a little bit more digital, a little more transparent. And um, that's what I'm trying to do. You know? Like being able to put out this 1,491 videos uh, over this five years also needs a certain drive uh, and a certain energy and a certain long-term passion. What were the, the factors that what motivated you the most? It isn't something that's yeah, with a video, you might earn like 10 euros or something. Sometimes it's, it's monet doesn't make sense monet monetarily. I think for me, it's like a little bit like sport. Yeah. I, I just like the game and I want to win it. Yeah. And I try to become the best investor I can be. And I think that's the thing where relative to other things I can be, or maybe I'm world class at the, or at least in, 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 in German speaking area. And, um, then I'm getting ambitious. When I when I see something, um, then I, I try to be really good there. And um, on other topics, then I really neglect them. But um, I think 
but also general life if you try to money is some add on it's not what um motivates me and it's try it's more like you want to be good and it's also um, yeah to be right yeah i think you also know every other investor likes this feeling if you have a thesis and it works out it just gives you some some pleasure monetary but also um like emotional and um like a sportsman that you um, try to become the best what you can be yeah so this this also helps to find a discipline to to put all the effort in this and uh, this this competition drive of you yeah Competition and passion for the um, for the topic. Yeah? I mean, if you do a video, often you, you have a new idea for a stock, and then you do your research, and um, maybe you find a stock what's the next, the ten bagger, and and, and, and um, brings you to the I don't know to very good performance or the monetary reward. And yeah, I, yeah, and then you never know what you what you will find if you start looking and. Um, I think it's it's very interesting. It's one of the jobs what's every day is different and you still can do it till you're 90. And um yeah, I think it's it's uh, it has also its downsides, yeah. You you cannot really do vacations. What's uh, and on the short term you um yeah, do depend on the mercy of the market and sometimes it can be very frustrating because and also a lot of friends of mine who were ambitious, I think they couldn't be good stock market investors because then they're used to it. If they work more, the result is better. And in the stock market, at least in the short term, that's not the case. Huh? If you're under, under pressure or if you're underwater and you you work 80 hours instead of 60 hours, the result doesn't get better, maybe even worse because you have to be a little bit, um, I would say, in a, in a good mood and also the this combination of confidence, but also um, a risk averse. Um, and if you, you, you cannot put, um, uh, reach your goals with pressure in, in, in the short term. And um, this is maybe the downside, but yeah, I think um, you see it in the videos. And then before I was, when I was writing the blog, I was really like two years at the end, looking at a wall in a small flat in Munich and writing this. And um, yeah, I'll, but I always had this par target. I want to start a fund business one day. Uh, and um, this, I think, uh, was motivating me as well. Yeah. But there's also a certain risk if you have fulfilled this target, being like one of the best investors in Germany and uh, posting about it and you've reached it. The question is where you get the drive to find the next target. How are you thinking about this? Yeah, I, I still have uh, um, some targets in, 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 in life. Even if I would reach that, then maybe, um, yeah, that you, um, help more people to invest better and then they that they have more, um, better lives, financial independent lives. I think, um, yeah, and you never will see, you never be able to say that's the best investor. I think it's always a little bit. Uh, <laughs> One of the best I said. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and to be honest, it's not like, I'm not like this sportive ego that I have to be the best and others are, are worse. That's not what's motivating me. Yeah? Then I, I think it's also strange for me as an investor. I don't have this big ego. Yeah? I always know that I'm wrong. And if I'm wrong, I, yeah, I cut my losses or I, re I reduce the risk. And, um, yeah, I, I just want to, I think, um, creating an, an, a nice business and I have some ideas all around investing and I just like it. And maybe in 20, 30 years, um, I don't know, but now, um, I'm, I'm pretty happy w with what I'm doing. And, um, yeah, and because I also ask myself the question, what would you do if you money wouldn't play a role and slowly, um, you come to this, um, um, level. And then I would say, I would just read books about investing or, um, um topics, um, a little bit related to that. Um, talk with interesting people and maybe travel. Yeah. And at the end in investing, you can combine those three things pretty well. So, um, yeah, it's also a lifestyle decision a little bit because, um, the nice thing about investing is you ha can have a scalable business without having to manage like 100 people or something. And the same with media and YouTube as well. Huh? And the, the video, um, you also know something, sometimes a video is a lot of work and you get, it doesn't get a lot of views and another video gets 10 times more views and was less work. So this uh, relationship between input and output in, in this world is not um, always um, concurrent. So yeah, this is also what, what, um, what I like. 
Maybe let's take a look again at your YouTube channel. You have this 26,000 subscribers, which is <laughs> strong for a German finance channel. In hindsight, what have been the factors that have made you successful? I would say for the input and the year started, I'm, it's not super successful because I'm also, I did, didn't do so much mainstream content eh? because um, you have to, you can do two kinds of videos. Eh? The most of my videos I did a little bit them for myself. Eh? I was doing research on some under research company and for sure about a stock, nobody knows the people are clicking less about than I don't know the next Tesla video or I don't know how you double, double your money next month, etc. Um, I would say it's the continuity that every day video and um, more and more people realize, okay, he knows what he's doing because I have the track record with Wikifolio. I have the professional background from university banking finance. I worked in industry. And if you compare that with others, for sure, a lot of people don't realize, um, then a lot of people thought, okay, um, he has a little bit more professional background and uh, in, the, in the long term, maybe it's, uh, information is more valuable than, than the other one. Yeah, but we'll see. Um, and at the end, it depends on the YouTube algorithm and the algorithm depends on how long the people are viewing a video and how much they click on it. So, yeah. Interesting. Maybe let's move to your second or most important social media presence or social investing presence is Wikifolio. Maybe you can explain for the viewers that never heard Wikifolio what it is. Yeah, um, Wikifolio, everybody can become a fund manager. <laughs> Sounds a bit scary, but um, it's not a real fund. It's a certificate, what's not so popular in the US. So that's the big downside that you don't have an um, risk that the, the company who's um, emitting those um, certificates goes bankrupt. It's protected to some degree, yeah, um, but it's for sure it's not the same protection than a real fund. And it works like that. You, you manage um, a portfolio, like you buy 2%, but you don't buy it virtual. It's just a game. And another company is guaranteeing the performance of this portfolio. And you can uh, buy the certificate with the guarantee of the performance um, of this portfolio. So they also have to hedge, they have to buy the stocks, um, especially if you're a bigger Wikifolio that they don't have a risk that your stocks doubled and they have to pay uh, the investors. So um, I think it's very interesting. Um, for me, it was one of the most uh, interesting fintech companies in Europe and I'm still a big, big fan. And um, I don't know why it doesn't exist in US, probably a bit of regulation, and um, you have a lot of transparency. You see all the time what's in it, what the people are doing. And um, yeah, and it also, I think, gave me some credibility combined with YouTube because on YouTube, you could see how I'm working, what I'm doing. And on Wikifolio, you could see it's not just a private portfolio, what um, was even much better, but um, you can also have an investable product um, and um that I think um, like enforce each other. Then you have a little bit like a flywheel effect if you're um, um, relevant on both platforms. Let's take a look at uh, the eight Wikifolios uh, you have managed and uh, it had different strategies. I think your biggest Wikifolio with 15 million invested is the Nebenwerte Europa, like small and mid caps Europe, but you also have the sustainable dividend stars or it's the brand stupid digital revolution, invest research, stock picker, venture capital strategies, owner operators, and invest research multi strategies. How do you have the capability to manage eight strategies at the same time? I think also this Kuvum R model or this um, FUP model helped me a lot no? because for sure. Some stocks there in all um, Wikifolios, or you have some, <laughs> it's not uh, completely new portfolios. And um, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm doing this full time with the research. And um, yeah, if you think a, co a company is good long time, then you buy it. And um, maybe the weightings, they change a little bit through momentum. Um, but yeah, it worked for me. Yeah, I have to say. And also, I have to say, there are fund managers who man manage four or five funds with billions under management. 
I think it's, it's possible, especially if you have a long-term vision, yeah, a long-term perspective. I think it gets much more work if you play like the quarter game, what I'm not doing, like how will be the next quarter no, quarterly numbers. Normally, maybe in core positions, yes, but normally I don't care. Yeah, I don't have an edge in that. And um, yeah. So let's take a deeper look at your uh, Nebenwerte Europa or small and mid-caps Europe Wikifolio, which is the biggest. Um, how would you describe the strategy in this Wikifolio? What is your general approach here? Mm -hmm. um, well, like the name said, it's small mid cap in, in the whole Europe. And I manage it with the cool from AIM model. What I said, quality, first step, then fundamental, second, momentum and alpha idea. And I think the performance is good or excellent. But what's really impressive is the maximum risk of 20% over like six, seven years, because I think two or three times the small cap market tank 40% or something. So um, what works with the school from Mamono, if the momentum gets negative in stocks, I automatically go 1% weighting of the portfolio and then um, I have cash, but I'm not investing <laughs> at the moment. So that also works well as a risk model, but for sure, um, in Wikifolio, I could, what I don't know whether I did it, maybe maybe more for a short time, you can go to 80% cash, what an investment fund you cannot do. You always have to be at least 51% invested. So it's a little bit for sure in apples, not an apples to apples comparison, but um, I think it's a, um, a sign and the performance should be even better because you see the first one and a half years, I was doing nothing. <laughs> it was really stupid. And um, so the performance per year should be even better if you say the strategy started um, one and a half years later. And so we have a 20% plus performance per year with a maximum risk of 20%. And I think um, the ideas are good for sure. I'm investing more in technology and quality, but also I try to combine different industries, different countries. And uh, normally I'm not in the high flyer stocks. Huh? Um, they're really expensive and just momentum driven. I'm not invested, but often then they go down on one day minus 30%. Normally I'm not invested in them, maybe maximum like a quality position or um, with 0.5%. So um, I also think a lot about the risk and like an artist about the combination of this painting um, that, you that you have a little bit from everything. And um, I think it worked um, um, pretty well for sure. Not every time period, but um, um, over the next six, seven years, I think it's a pretty um, good product in, in this area. Taking this picture of the artist currently have 95 positions in the portfolio. So you're drawing with 95 colors at the moment. Um, usually like if the other videos and the other guests, I usually have like 10, maybe five till 20 positions in the portfolio. Why weren't you boiling it down to less positions? And why did you go for this? big, uh, big, colorful portfolio? Um, for sure, if I have like 10 ideas, I'm completely um, convicted, uh, convinced, sorry. And um, then maybe I would also invest more in them, but also I tried from the risk perspective. Yeah? Then um, if you just have 10 ideas, you have much, much more volatility. And... Um, I think also the ranking Wikifolio and the risk uh, method, um, um, you benefit a little bit if you're more diversified. But for sure, if I'm convinced of something, I can go, I don't say all in, but um, have a position um, to maximum 10%. This I, I would do. But um, some stocks I couldn't buy in Wikifolio, uh, maybe I, where I would have done it. And um, we also have to say, yeah, the valuations are pretty high um, in a lot of markets. So... I don't have this no-brainer stocks at the moment. It's difficult to find. Yeah? And um, and if from the valuation perspective in, in China, there's some no-brainer stocks, but you have the regulation risk and this also a long-tail risk you cannot um, completely rule out. So it's difficult. Yeah? And, um, and so I I'd more try to combine dif different um, um, stocks and um, yeah. And also, I'm interested in a lot of topics. So, um, uh, yeah. If you if you think about your top 10 positions um, and the amount of research you do for this top 10 positions, I should have calculated how many they are, but I think they might be around 20, 24% of the portfolio. Mm -hmm. 
how deep is the research uh, you're investing into these ideas? How deep are you digging to to make it a free point position free or something like this? Hey, Tillman here. I'm sure you're curious about the answer to this question. But this answer is exclusive to the members of my community, Good Investing Plus. Good Investing Plus is a place where we help each other to get better as investors day by day. If you are an ambitious, long-term oriented investor that likes to share, please apply for Good Investing Plus. Just go to good-investing.net slash plus. You can also find this link in the show notes. I'm waiting for your application. And without further ado, let's go back to the conversation. So compared to the Wikifolio, what do you, do you want to do different in the fund? And are you planning to do deeper research and be more concentrated there as well or not? Well, if you compare Wikifolio and the fund, um, we talk about it. The fund is like the professional investment vehicle where people can invest millions. Um, I can invest in more stocks. And um, also I can trade more cheaply and the fund is even a little bit cheaper than Wikifolio. Uh, um, I personally just get 5% performance fee and the, the um, annual cost is 0.7%, but I almost get nothing from that. It's just for running the business with the partner. So I think the incentives are right there. And yeah, I would, if I'm seeing something interesting, I would do um, definitely more core positions. I mean, I had in my private portfolio sometimes 10, 15% rating, even even more. This I cannot do in, in, in the video follow. Some, sometimes it happens um, if the, the stock multiplies. Huh? You start with 4, 5% and then it increases and I'm not selling then if I still think the company is attractive valued and um, the, the trend is right. Um, but yeah, for sure, if it is the first five weeks, um, now I invested the whole um, spectrum of, of stocks, but um, not invested so much in core position with this, I would need more time. Uh, and I, I was also a little bit, I don't say scared of the market. I'm now much more optimistic, but um, in summer, it, it, it feels a little bit like 2018, yeah, where we had first the China problematic, then you had the interest rate system at the um, topic. So, and um, some markets were not working and just the U.S. was working. I think this is not the, t uh, the case now. Um, but for, for this, I was a bit reluctant um, to go um, with very high weightings. And we still see the market. Sometimes a stock is um, hitting its numbers and the stock tanks 30% at the moment. So um, it's maybe um, you have to be um, a little bit careful, especially as you start a fund. You don't want to have like the crazy volatility and um, maybe if you're a little bit like it's like a race. Yeah, if, you, if you're 10% um, in front, then you, you can do it more. And you, um, yeah. If let's look a bit, a bit back to the last five years and see what you've done on Wikifolio on YouTube. How did both of this help for setting up the fund and what was the plus of it? I think it helped a lot. I think um, the start of my fund wouldn't have been possible um, five years ago. And I think um, YouTube and Wikifolio helped it a lot. For sure, also my professional background and, and the social media. But I don't have anybody um, who invested like 10 million as a seed investor, what's like the typical case. Um, so um, I own 100% of the company um, who advises this fund. And... Um, I think I got the reach with YouTube, yeah, 25,000, for sure a lot of private investors, but also people from the industry are, are watching that because um, a lot of my, uh, my stock analyzers are off the beaten track. And Wikifolio gave me a credibility that I have a track record. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's it's a combination. I'm on both platforms. They're bigger ones, but I'm both, I think I would, I'm, I'm a relevant player. And if you combine it, um, they're, I think in combination, there's nobody um, and both very strong. So um, I think that helped a lot now. But also, even if you just have that, it's work. And um, also like um, that you have the professional background that you know how the industry is working because it's different to manage a Wikifolio and a fund. Um, you have the fund flows, et cetera. And it's it's not so easy. For, um, no. How have you thought about fees uh, for the fund? you've set up and what is your take on this? 
Yeah, I think I mentioned before, for me, it was always important that um, to save a little bit the reputation of the active investors. And I think if you do it cheaper, then also your performance is better. Yeah? I also invest a lot of money in the fund by my own, so I don't want to pay so much fees. And for sure, I also have the idea that if I create an, a product what's cheaper and maybe the performance is better then it can be really become really, really big and that people talk about it, that they say, hey, that's fair. Huh? Because I think people often, they don't want to invest in stocks on their own huh? because um, a lot of people do, but some people, also, it's a full-time job. I mean, I'm doing 50, 60 hours a, a week or more and for nine years. So if you have a normal job and um, I think it's, pretty hard that you try to say, okay, I'm, I can do it better, maybe in, in some months, no? but if, from, from the setup. So, and you also have, you have some tax um, advantages um, of unrealized gains and those things. So um, I try to pr uh, create a product, what I would recommend um, my friends, even if I wouldn't be the, <laughs> the, uh, um, the advisor. So uh, that was a little bit the idea behind. Uh, and, and also this time, uh, um, topic, financial literacy, that you really have a product, what can, can compete with the MSA award? Because if somebody asks you, ask you, uh, where shall I invest 10, 20,000 euro? Your standard um, answer is, yeah, you start with an MSA world ETF, but that's, I think it's right with 10,000 euro. But if you have a little bit more, I think you wouldn't put everything there. So you should, would combine a little bit different um, approaches and topics. And um, if you're almost as cheap as a uh, passive index fund, I think your chances of outperformance are pretty, pretty high, even if you don't believe um, that I'm the, the super duper investor. And um, yeah, and at the end, the industry, if I can live from my own investments, I don't need the fund business and it's the costs are not so high. So you can uh, normally the, the salaries are very high from the, from those peoples. But if I'm the owner, I don't need a salary. So um, I can... Um, uh, do it extremely cheap in comparison to to others. Yeah. Did you also recommend the fund to you, not only to a friend? So are you invested yourself with a big portion of your money? Yeah, I just did a video. At the end, it's for me, it's a, a, a private family office. The majority of my liquid net worth is in there. Um, I showed it's over 1 million euro. So I think the... Um, Incentives are right. Yeah? Um, I just earn if I make performance and I won't do so much I won't go in a risky way because the majority of my money is in there. So I invested like my, my, my own money because it's my own money at the end. So you have this, this fee, this zero, zero point seven that covers the external costs and you earn when you hit this 5% performance fee. The performance is bigger as 5% or how is the. No, no, no. Um, five percent performance fee means if the fund does 20%, 1% goes to me, 90% to the investors. And it has a high water, also, but it starts at zero. Yeah? It has not a hurdle rate, but it has a, a high watermark, what doesn't um, reset up every year. So um, I think it's pretty fair. Uh, pretty fair. I mean, a hedge fund has 2% and 20%. So we hit just 5%. And at the end, if the fund bets gets bigger, 0.5% cost. So if you compare to a hedge fund, is um, one quarter of the cost. And if you compare it to normal investment for what a normal private investor would buy, you have probably 2% um, yearly costs and maybe also 10% performance fee. So uh, I would say it's less than a half. Maybe let's go back to your portfolio and help me understand one thing I haven't fully understood. When do you buy and sell certain securities or stocks you're, you have in your fund? What are the defectors that play a role for this? Hey, Tillman here. I'm sure you're curious about the answer to this question. But this answer is exclusive to the members of my community, Good Investing Plus. Good Investing Plus is a place where we help each other to get better as investors day by day. If you are an ambitious, long-term oriented investor that likes to share, please apply for Good Investing Plus. Just go to good-investing.net slash plus. You can also find this link in the show notes. I'm waiting for your application. And without further ado, let's go back to the conversation. One can say that you now bought into the fund. Does this mean that you sold YouTube and Wikifolio to a certain extent? Or how are you waiting these this activities in the future? 
No, YouTube will always be, and uh, Wikifolio will always be an important part. But for sure, Wikifolio, I won't do everyday video. Yeah, YouTube, um, the topics maybe will change a little bit. Maybe I will focus more on, on, on longer and quality videos and also do interviews, for example, to, with um, CEOs. Um, that's something I, uh, that I can um, show my research to others. I think that's also efficient that the CEO doesn't have to answer the the 20 silly questions 100 times. You can also do it online and show it what you're also doing with investors. And um, Wikifolio, um, you see the Nebenwetter or Europa or small cap, it's, it's a different strategy than the fund. And I will manage it um, as before. The other Wikifolio, I would do it a little bit more passive, like not trading every day. I think it doesn't have to harm the performance. And um, maybe the maximum risk can, uh, um, can increase a little bit that I'm, I'm not trying to do so much market timing than, than in the past. Um, yeah, but uh, I think I, ha I still have a lot of um, freed up time because I will do less YouTube. So I think um, it won't won't suffer, but for sure, yeah. YouTube, you won't see um, everyday video uh, from me, but also I think you can do it for two years, but at some time then, yeah, it's it's pretty, <laughs> pretty, you also know it, uh, it can be, it's a lot of work and it also um, at some time it's, it's also it feels good to slow down a little bit there. Yeah, <laughs> I feel you. Sometimes it's hard to keep this output pace quite high. Yeah. Um, we looked at the beginning. We looked back five years, and uh, maybe let's try to look out five years and see where you might be in twenty twenty six. What is your long term plan for the next five years? I don't know whether I'm happy to 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 share that here. Yeah, um, it's, it's the best news. Please share. Yeah, it. I think for me, <laughs> was, <laughs> for me, was definitely important to to start a, um, a fund. Yeah, but I think it's um, not, not a secret that for me was a ten years plan, and um, uh, yeah, now it looks pretty good that uh, at least um, it, it worked. But for sure, um, when that works well, I have maybe. Um, more ideas for a funder maybe to create uh, to make the company a little bit bigger because now I'm it's pretty small but I w never want to create a huge company yeah but uh, maybe that you have some people uh, where you can talk to maybe have a little bit different investment products and um, maybe create a very inspiring co um, company culture I think that's also a bit missing in the industry and um, that could also motivate me to, like, <laughs> to create a second family I don't know yeah but also Living quality. Uh, at the moment, at the moment, you're very free. That's also very nice. And as soon as you have employees, you also have more responsibility. Um, so I have to um, think about it. So I'm, and I wouldn't be too unhappy if it wouldn't work out. But um, yeah, uh, we'll see how the performance will be. Um, this is like also in this business. Uh, if 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 the fund doubles in in one or two years, yeah, then the money comes. And um, if not, not. Yeah. Um, so we'll see. Um, but um, yeah, I'm I'm optimistic, and I have some ideas in, in, still in my life, even if the fund uh, is successful. In which bits, spaces you could need help? Because currently you're doing it as a one-man band, and you have some tasks that might be better if you have someone who helps you and specializes on this. Yeah, I think on the investing it wouldn't be bad to have like one one um, analyst who can help you a little bit with um, some some tasks. Yeah, because I'm, I would say my specialty is also big picture and be fast. And then maybe, um, one who does more, um, the, the more detailed work. Yeah. And, um, maybe also in the content business sales for sure. Um, yeah. but that, that's also nice in the business. You don't need too many people. Some because I was thinking about doing startup when I was younger after university, but I never found a real co-founder. Um, because I'm from a business university, um, and you need a, for my ideas, you need a technical co-founder. So, um, it's pretty uh, difficult to find, especially if you're from university and uh, you don't have so much to show for. So, um, I decided to go for a business where you don't need a co-founder. And, um, I'm also happy for that because if you have 100% of a company, it doesn't have to become so big that you can, um, live pretty well off it. Um, because, and you don't have to compromise with co-founders, with investors, etc. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm also happy with, the, with that decision. Yeah. I have come to an end with my questions. Is there anything you want to add for the end of our interview that gives us new context on you, that is needed context on you? 
I think, um, yeah, you find a lot of things about me in YouTube, about my book, for sure. How I'm thinking is all in German. Yeah, my target market is Germany. So um, if, you're, if you're German, feel free to contact me. Um, if you're, for example, interested in the fund, uh, let's make a um, short video call um, to show more information if you have questions. And um, yeah, I think you realize I'm... I'm motivated um, to um, improve the industry, to improve the products, improve the, maybe the lives of some people. And um, yeah, that's something um, what you can not just hopefully see from this interview, but maybe also from, from the things I did. And uh, that's, I think that's it. <laughs> Then thank you very much for the value you add. And thank you very much to the audience to stay up till now. And bye-bye to you all. Bye Thanks, Tilman. Bye-bye. As in every video, also here is the disclaimer. You can find the link to the disclaimer below in the show notes. The disclaimer says, always do your own work. What we're doing here is no recommendation and no advice. So please always do your own work. Thank you very much.